course, okay. of course. Okay, thank you, Alex. Hello, delegates. I hope you are doing well. Today we welcome our third speaker, uh, a civic hacker and Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. Audrey is known for revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Haskell, as well as building the online spreadsheet system EtherCalc in collaboration with Dan Bricklin. In the public sector, Audrey served on Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee and KTOV Curriculum Committee, and led the country's first e-roll marking project. In the private sector, Audrey worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics with Oxford University Lexicography and with social text on social interaction design. In the voluntary sector, Audrey contributed to Taiwan's Gov, a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for the civil society. Okay, so now can we all give a big round of applause and welcome our speaker, Audrey. Yes. Okay, before that, so we can see the QR code on the screen. If you have any questions, please scan and pose your questions there. Thank you. Audrey, uh, Miss Tang, can you can you? Hello. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, really happy to be here virtually uh, with all of you uh, to talk about. Well, whatever you want me to talk about, you see the agenda is determined by by you. So um, please scan the QR code, and if you cannot scan the QR code for whatever reason, please uh, visit this website slido.com. That's s l i d o dot com, uh, and then enter the code eight zero. Uh, and once you are in the chat room, uh, in the Slido chat room, uh, you can ask pretty much any question there. Uh, and the question that you see other people ask that you would also like to ask, uh, simply press like. And the question with the most number of like will float to the top. Uh, and I will begin answering questions uh, once we have a few questions um, starting from the top. Uh, and any given moment, you can ask more questions and the newest one will uh, appear at the bottom right. Uh, and so this will go on until 5 to 10 Taipei time. Uh, and then at which point, uh, you know, um, if there's uh, questions left unanswered, uh, apology in advance, but I'll read them all. Um, but if we uh, do not have any new questions, uh, we may actually um, end the session before time. Well, this has never happened, but anyway. So yeah, so please think of some questions. And then um, the um, organizer um, tells me that I need to mention uh, our digital social innovation and counter coronavirus effort at least once. Uh, but don't let that limit your questions. I will somehow weave uh, that answer uh, into the answer of your questions, um, fulfilling the organizer's ask. So, so that's it. Um, please start asking questions. So first of all, Diana would like to know, from my experience, um, can I explain the link between the coding language and spoken languages? How interconnected are they? This is a great question. Um, in, so I think I'll begin with this uh, simple idea that um, when we first started uh, programming the programming language, um, we're inevitably shaped by the language uh, that we first learned. My first computer language is Logo. And Logo um, is a very interesting language uh, that basically moves a small cursor um, that's nicknamed a turtle uh, on the screen. And the language has a very simple vocabulary. Uh, you say turn left, the turtle turns left. Uh, you say move forward, the turtle moves forward while leaving a trail. Uh, and then you can go backward as well. Uh, and it has very simple um, loops uh, and like you can say repeat something once, twice, five times. And so it's very easy for it to start drawing geometric shapes like a tree or pentagram or whatever. And so uh, that's, uh, that's really interesting because the computer language, the coding language that I learned, I was eight years old at, at the time, corresponds almost uh, perfectly 
uh, to an intuitive understanding, uh, like uh, you tell the turtle to do something. So this is um, my first experience with computer languages, uh, which is making sure that uh, I can shape the interaction, the reality, if you will, on the screen um, of people's interactions, because many people can look at the same logo, the same turtle uh, at once. Um, and so it imbued in me a, a sense uh, that by writing program, uh, what used to only be in my mind uh, can be a shared space for everybody to interact, not unlike how Slido currently and WebEx, of course, um, defines the way that we interact. And so um, I think the link between the coding and spoken languages are then twofold. First, um, when I write code, it is also for other programmers to read. And when people write code, they don't start from scratch not even if they're programming in Scratch, uh, but rather they almost always remix other people's works. And so in that sense, it's not unlike any written language. On the other hand, the machine would take the written language and interpret uh, it just like a, a performer of an instrument will perform the musical notes written by the composer. Uh, but instead of a kind of melody uh, that fulfills um, people's spiritual needs, <laughs> uh, this is a melody of interaction that defines the uh, reality or at least a little bit of reality of how people interact. And so the interconnection uh, is very strong, uh, as I think uh, the Jestra, one famous programmer said, um, the, the more you can uh, use your uh, native language, natural language, uh, the better you're a programmer. A programmer of the programming language uh, ability is capped only by the fluency of which they can use the normal language, the natural language. On the other hand, though, the uh, programming languages um, has another property, as I said, a normativity uh, that if people's projection of what they think are the best way to interact um, is joined by many people, just as we currently join on Slido, and it shapes what's transparent, what's opaque. What's possible, for example, upvoting, what's not possible, for example, pressing reply. Um, and so that will also shape the social reality in a way that is may not be conscious uh, as with the legal normativity, because if you, if you um, follow a legal rule or regulation or whatever, there's also always room for interpretation and appeal. But for uh, algorithm, that is for programming code, there is no such um, rim. And so we need to use the programming language, I think, even more carefully and with even more participation and accountability than spoken languages. I hope that answers some of the question. Feel free to ask follow-ups. So two people would like to know, in my experience, how is civil activism more and more closely tied with the internet? Uh, another really good question. Um, my first experience with the World Wide Web um, was in, I think, 93. And at that uh, moment, I thought the World Web was just uh, places where people can share their academic uh, papers uh, or to share whatever uh, hobbies they have. I joined my first club uh, that I joined in the World Wide Web was a club of people sharing tips on how to memorize pi, uh, that is the pi ratio, uh, to 100 decimal places, uh, which is a very harmless hobby. But anyway, so none of this qualify as civil activism. But then um, I also observed that people come to trust each other very swiftly, even over harmless things like memorizing the decimal places of pi. Uh, and then uh, people start to identify with this imagined community, this why, or maybe because that we have never met face to face. Um, and so um, when the Blue Ribbon Campaign started, that's the Communication Decency Act passed in the US that has a clause that uh, basically said any um, bulletin board system, uh, system up, uh, administrator need to make sure that they censor their speech uh, by making sure that everybody who can post is either an adult, uh, and I was just 13 years old, 14 back then, uh, or that they are uh, shielded uh, from possible indecent material. 
Now, uh, of course, the Pi Club um, has nothing to do with you know violence, graphic violence, or pornography. Uh, but uh, people feel that they're a collateral because they have to start censoring, start doing age checks, start doing real name checks or whatever of the community. And I, as someone who um, lives in a very different country and definitely not an adult, uh, will then um, pay the price by having uh, myself excluded from many forums and many communities. And so people felt very strongly about it actually and started the Blue Ribbon campaign. And suddenly all the websites that I frequently visit, a lot of them start turning their uh, pages black uh, and starting to feature this hyperlink, the Blue Ribbon, uh, so that you can click and learn more about the um, Communication Decency Act. And so uh, this is the first civil activism that I encountered on the World Wide Web. And it very quickly uh, educated a lot of us about how the um, First Amendment works, how the U.S. Constitution is designed, how the Bill of Rights works, and so on. So I got this U.S. Uh, politics education, really, uh, um, in this Blue Ribbon campaign when I was 14 years old in Taiwan. Uh, and so, and it was successful. I mean, uh, eventually the Supreme Court ruled that part unconstitutional, uh, and we left with um, a internet that is largely uh, self-governed uh, rather than uh, government governed for the next decade or so. Um, and so uh, I think whatever we learned during that uh, very horizontal, it's almost like a hashtag, right? Just like a hashtag, Blue Ribbon. Um, the Blue Ribbon icon, uh, you can use it uh, without asking anyone's permission, that starts to weave with the uh, very new uh, post-presidential election uh, Taiwan that is starting from 1996 uh, when um, President Li Denghui uh, first um, started to basically um, open up openly contested uh, presidential elections. People who campaign online would then start to learn from the Blue Ribbon campaign and other campaigns in a way to invent uh, catchy phrases, memes, hashtags, and so on uh, for their presidential candidates. And that started in 96. So quite unique in Taiwan. Uh, democracy and internet for us are not two things, but rather they are interwoven together. Because before the internet, there was no democracy to speak of in Taiwan. We were still under the martial law. And before the World Web, there was no direct presidential election. Now, fast forward uh, to the age of mobile phone. Um, and people discover that instead of being confined uh, in computer classes or uh, on their de desks, they can now go to the street while being connected to the internet. So we have uh, one of the first largest flash mobs in Taiwanese history, uh, that is the Hong Zhong Qiu event, or the so-called Silver Cross event, when people protested uh, of the uh, Minister of Defense lack of transparency when it comes to uh, a Hong Zhong Qiu incident. Uh, and so a quarter million people occupied uh, the the Cataclan uh, Street uh, uh, Boulevard, uh, and uh, there was this overhead uh, photo of a, a people holding up their mobile phone in the night, uh, and the silver light basically um, permeated on the street. A lot of my friends were there uh, in 2013, and uh, because they were just um, holding a Coast Cup, a conference on open source uh, coders, users, and promoters. And while they did join uh, that parade, uh, that protest, they discovered that the mobile internet simply doesn't work uh, because at the time we're still in 3G network on the street. So their mobile phone uh, could be used as a light torch, I'm sure, but that's also because nobody could actually connect to the internet on the street with that high A density. Uh, and so for the next six months, uh, we would work on a collective document that tries to Imagine if we have a half a million people on the street and many more online, how to connect the two. And so at the end, it culminated uh, to the Sunflower Movement uh, with indeed half a million people online, but we were prepared then. We used, uh, uh, at the time, very new uh, YMAX network 
which will serve its purpose and uh, be replaced by 4G network. But it's a bootstrapping uh, network that we can use uh, to uh, make people on the street still connect to the internet online uh, with a lot of Wi-Fi repeaters. Uh, and people who occupy the parliament can then, for the first time, um, instead of uh, just guessing what's happening in the occupied parliament, they can see through walls in a sense because we set up the projectors on the street so that people can see the occupied uh, parliament. There's even a stenographer, a team of stenographers, court reporters that types whatever being deliberated in the occupied parliament. So it serves as truly a parliament um, for public, for deliberation. Uh, and more than 20 NGOs on the street use the same horizontal network to connect themselves together to deliberate about all aspects of the cross-strait service and trade agreement. Uh, including whether in the new 4G network uh, we need to allow PRC, People's Republic of China regime components or not. The answer was no on the street. Uh, and after three weeks of Occupy, um, I think people who are online who look at a live stream and participate to the parliament helped keeping this non-violent because everybody is watching, uh, keeps the police force honest because they counter surround the police all the time and ultimately deliver the set of four demand, not one less, the consensus of the sunflower that was then ratified by the head of parliament. So the Occupy was a success. And so that's a very brief, uh, short um, glimpse of how uh, internet-led civil uh, society activism can link to the street uh, by having the internet connectivity right there on the street. Uh, and so we would, of course, later on help people around the world uh, who want to have this form of organization online and help them with the logistics and so on and export um, so-called sunflower technology. Five people would like to know uh, what inspired me to join politics rather than solely focusing on my research? Well, you see, my research uh, is on social interaction design. Uh, and so um, the burning question that led me to the internet community in the first place was the question of swift trust. Why would people place trust in each other? Uh, because of psychological projection, gestalt, imagined community. There's many different hypotheses back in the late 90s of why people online can collaborate so much easier than people who meet face to face. And that is um, my, my research question. And so that would lead me, uh, as I mentioned, uh, to the Blue Ribbon Campaign, to the World Wide Web Consortium, to the Internet Engineering Task Force, and to the Pearl community. And all of them have in common this open innovation model where the political apparatus is basically meritocracy. Anyone who has a good point and an email address could be invited as code makers, that is to say lawmakers, uh, in the Internet Engineering Task Force. Moreover, when everybody um, started to think along the common lines and nobody has the coercive power of stopping new innovation from happening, rough consensus and running code. Uh, that is to say, we agree on something that we broadly have an idea and we can live with it. We don't have to sign a treaty or a fine consensus, but rather there's just something barely enough for the coders to start doing their work. That sort of political process becomes far more superior than the old uh, top-down way of dictatorship or uh, voting, uh, which is majority rule or whatever previous political systems uh, that came before it. It's a new political system enabled by the internet and used to govern the internet even to this day. And so um, that's political. And so I, I was immersed in this political system for uh, I think five years uh, before I even cast my first vote legally. Uh, and so that's kind of my indigenous uh, political system that's uh, always shaped my thinking. And so I'm basically currently doing is uh, projecting what I've been learning uh, since I was 15 years old in my research, that's rough consensus, civic participation, um, and the idea of radical transparency uh, in my daily work as a channel from this um, new way of policy making to the, the common people, to the common ground. And bringing, empowering, as I learned uh, on the internet, the people who are the most innovative are the actually people who use the technology the most, not the people who code the technology. And so open source, uh, the term is invented as a 
fork as a rebranding of the free software movement、uh, to emphasize that if all all the people can co-create code instead of treating you know users as users, we can treat users as fellow citizens that have good ideas of how it it may work. And so, open innovation model、uh, around the late nineties、uh, was the main、um, topic、uh, in my entrepreneurship,、uh, making tools that、uh, people can collaborate together, like the collaborative spreadsheet that I worked、uh, with Dan Brinkley,、uh, inventor of spreadsheet,、uh, or you know, like Google Docs and things like that. And it will also culminate、uh, into a suite. Of collaboration software、uh, that is then packaged together as a cybersecurity software called Sandstorm at Sandstorm.io, and it's all free software. Everything is open source, and everybody who have an idea,、uh, saying you know, let's collaborate on I don't know ordering lunch boxes together, they can very simply write a, a software and put it into the secure sandbox for everybody to share in the same Sandstorm platform, and that's what I brought into the cabinet as the digital. Minister, so、um, the lunchbox ordering app is actually one of the most popular one、um, in the、uh, mini- across the ministries,、uh, and any public servant can then serve the public by sharing their、um, favorite tools、uh, like Hack MD、uh, from the、um, civil society and bring it into the public service. And so I, I would say that I'm the, a politician only in the sense of the internet politics. And I'm still doing the internet politics. It's just with a lot more people to collaborate together across the public service around the world.、Uh, five people would like to know what do you think of the future of digital innovation will look like, and what challenges will there be? Excellent question. So、um, I think digital innovation is just the first two. Uh, letters uh, in our DG Plus plan. The DIGI plan starts with digitization and innovation, but then also complemented with governance and inclusion. So DIGI, very easy to remember.、Um, and so I think、uh, in Taiwan, the governance and inclusion of digital innovation is the most important value. We need to make sure that when we're、uh, pushing out, for example, 5G, that that's a core digitization、uh, technology and the innovation that could be enabled by 5G technology. For example, a very low latency、uh, interaction, co-presence, virtual and augmented reality, self-driving vehicles,、uh, and so on, that it benefits people across the country, not just. The people in large municipalities. In fact, the idea of what we call the more remote, the more advanced,、uh, says that we need to first deploy such technologies in the places that are suffering the most from the lack of transportation,、uh, and so、uh, on health and on education and so on. And that's inclusion. And then governance also important. We need to make sure that people understand, as I mentioned, the norms that's being shaped by those new technologies, and that to make sure that people can broadly agree in a sandbox. That is to say, a limited time, limited risk experimentation field of how to interact with, say, self-driving vehicles. What kind of social signals do this vehicle need to?、Um, Um, share with the people in the surroundings. What kind of accountability、uh, account need they need to give when they make a decision? Should it yield first to the elderly or to the children?、Uh, in Taiwan,、uh, it should first yield to the elderly. But in Boston,、uh, the consensus was they should yield to the children. You see different social norms, and so on.、Uh, and so、uh, all of this is governance technology or reg tech that we need to develop、uh, in tandem. With the、uh, disruptive or quote unquote disruptive technology, and so the challenge is always that the people、uh, would not be interested enough to participate in the norm shaping, and that is why、uh, we make sure that、uh, the interesting conversations that we post, for example, there is a polis conversation going on、uh, right now actually at polis. That's P O L I S. That gov. That tw. Slash ocean,、uh, and we ask people to share their norms around.、Uh, now that we have five G, people 
can do much more um, work uh, in the seaside, uh, in the oceans, and so on, while being connected to broadband internet. And what new future will it bring to us? And how can we uh, make sure that the ocean is collectively governed uh, and instead of uh, just basically saying that uh, you should not go to uh, the oceans and you will be kept safe by the sea guard. That was the old stance and we're opening up the oceans. But how exactly that is for collective intelligence to inform us and for us to have a live stream deliberation uh, on not only the information system, but also on the legal code that regulates the ocean use. And so that's for me, the future of digital innovation is not just Internet of Things, it's Internet of Beings, oceans, mountains, and so on, have a voice uh, by people who care about them. And that's plurality for me, not singularity. Brian and six other people would like to know, what do you think Taiwan has remained a more cash-based society compared to other places like the US? And do you think there will be a push towards mobile payments? Well, cash is very easy and readily available in Taiwan because pretty much all the convenience stores have a ATM. And the convenience stores is very densely packed in Taiwan, more than 12,000 of them. And so in all the ATMs, because it's so easy to withdraw and nowadays to deposit cash, it's not um, considered difficult uh, to get cash. And so uh, the mobile payment needs not only to be more convenient than the easy card or credit card payments, which is already quite difficult. Uh, if you add to it a QR code or a fingerprint uh, or a retina scanner uh, on your phone, for example, that's already uh, taking longer time than the easy card. So not only it need to be easier than easy card, it also need to be easier to access and more featureful than the ATM and convenience store, which is already very featureful. Uh, and so I think this is great because then it makes the innovators innovate truly on the ways that are very convenient to people. For example, I finally switched to mobile payments uh, most of the time when the um, Android system that I use uh, finally switched uh, to not requiring any fingerprint or uh, password or QR code. I can just unlock the phone uh, or if it's already unlocked, I don't have to do anything and I just put the phone to the um, um, post system. And, and that's the like maybe half a second. And that's finally a shorter time compared to the easy card or cash. Uh, and that's that's great. Uh, and um, we also uh, met with innovators, for example, that do um, this post payment on their watch or even on the ring. Uh, but if it's a ring, um, it, you have to move very close to the post system because at the time, the regulation said that the maximum distance is, uh, I think, 1.25 centimeter uh, up to three centimeters at most for some devices. So if you move your fingers very close to the post machine, um, you will actually hurt your fingers. Uh, and then uh, we, of course, uh, adjusted a regulation so you can uh, more easily, uh, like five centimeters away uh, already, uh, do the payment for these class of devices. So our work is to make sure that the new innovations uh, do not get hampered by regulations, but they really need to compete uh, with really convenient access to cash, uh, almost no uh, fake uh, money, uh, and also um, a very easy to use, easy card. Uh, and so, yeah, there's of course uh, going to be a push toward mobile payment, but it's never to the exclusion to cash uh, and easy card and credit card payments. Um, they need to, innovate also. So all the different payment methods would innovate uh, and uh, race to become more convenient to people. And we do not legislate or regulate based on the device, uh, but rather we regulate and legislate based on the convenience it offers to the people. And uh, that's opposed to other uh, jurisdictions, of course, uh, because uh, other jurisdictions may have a preference of particular forms of payments. Um, and because of course they their access to cash or access to easy card wasn't that easy to begin with, uh, but that's uh, particular to that jurisdiction. It's not something linear that we compete. Uh, John would like to know, as a unschooler myself, what's my take on modern higher education? Excellent question. 
Um, so I quit junior high uh, and to start a company, but also to um, attend uh, graduate level classes in universities. And many of my professors, I, I call them my professors, even though I don't have a uh, enrollment or a degree, uh, because uh, I think there are really people who collaborate with me uh, on my research. And so if you have a research question, university student or not, degree or not, universities, higher education will always be your community. I still publish to open access journals on v Taiwan on the social archive, so archive.org, um, even after become MA and become a digital minister. Uh, and so I, I think um, universities serve, of course, the dual purpose, right, as a research community, academic community, as well as a, a school, right, for people to get a degree. Uh, I personally have zero experience of the second part, but I think the first part is as vibrant as ever. Uh, and nowadays, uh, with ideas like university social responsibility or USR, people uh, in universities get a degree or do a research program based on how they can serve as think tank of their local community and solve structural problems based on the sustainable development goals. Um, and so uh, you can see a lot of social entrepreneurs working closely with higher education and their products. And um, I promise this is just I, what I see um, close to my desk. This is not prearranged and definitely not a product placement, uh, but this is, I think, uh, from the eastern part of Taiwan, uh, and they uh, roll out this rice, black rice, uh, that revitalizes the land, and working with the university social responsibility programs, um, they collaborate uh, with the three of the 17 sustainable goals and with a QR code for people to understand uh, the story. And the uh, reason why they can work so well um, in such a short time as young entrepreneurs winning a lot of awards is that they work closely with the university, the higher education people that uh, specialize in agriculture, technology, in uh, uh, food safety, in participatory accountability for organic farming and things like that. So um, I think the university gives rise to new way uh, of um, you know giving rise uh, to new ways of uh, agriculture uh, on the community. A, a lot of students just get their research program fulfilled. And nowadays, they can even get a graduate degree based on the social impact that they make to the community. I think that's one uh, future of modern higher education is for everyone, inclusive, lifelong, and cross-discipline. Uh, five people said, do you think we should do more experimental education in Taiwan? Definitely. In Taiwan, uh, experimental education is like the research arm of the education system. It's not only legal, up to 10% of uh, school children, actually all the way to university now, uh, can basically ignore uh, the curriculum, the national curriculum, and write their own personal or institutional or group curriculum uh, and say, okay, we're going to um, try it out. Uh, and um, because the previous batch, uh, like the past three to five years of um, reports from the experimental education, we already included them into the K-12 curriculum last year. And so uh, a lot of this autonomous learning, interaction, common good, competence-based instead of literacy-based, that is to say, uh, make sure that students are producers of media and data, not consumers of media and data only, and so on. These were education experiment ideas, but now they're firmly in the curriculum. So the more experimental education in Taiwan now start to explore more horizons, for example, the new situation that Taiwan now have more than 20 national languages, most of which indigenous. And so people will start experimental schools in the, for example, Amis region of the indigenous lands uh, and start teaching um, like math, physics, whatever in Amis, and then teaching English from Amis and basically ignore Bopomofa altogether. Uh, and so that's experimental because that's outside of our curriculum. But more and more people are trying out these different cultural perspectives so that instead of saying, you know, we need to catch up on the municipal education grade 
they will say, no, we start with the Amis culture and we will talk to the international culture from our perspective. And that is, I think, one of the new horizon for experimental education is to empower the uh, all the national languages in a transcultural fashion. Five people said, uh, to be continued. Uh, for those uh, that are interested in cultivating our minds similarly, can you share your reading habits and how you choose what to consume? From several interviews, I learned that you most likely educate yourself broadly and deeply to be the foundation of your ideas. You see, um, you know, this followed by that also works um, as the your original intended order. Anyway, so um, yeah, well, I'll just take these two uh, as the same question. Um, my reading habits is uh, really simple. I uh, flip, skim uh, books right before I go to sleep uh, without pronouncing it aloud in my mind. So I, I do a quiet um, scan of the book. So the book that I read uh, this way um, before going to sleep last night uh, was from uh, Posna, uh, and it's called uh, The Demogo... Um, the Demagogue Playbook, uh, Demagogue's Playbook, I think. So uh, the idea is that he uh, starts from describing the U.S. Constitution, how Hamilton and um, other people, um, well, I say Hamilton and other people because I'm a fan of the musical, uh, and the people who founded the Constitution, the Federalists, uh, uh, designed the system so that it would not be captured by populists. They designed this slow-moving uh, Senate uh, to keep a check to the faster-moving House and so on. And then they outlined how through the party system, which none of them imagined uh, would happen, um, can capture uh, the populist imagination uh, and then uh, basically uh, interact with the political system through a different um, idea, uh, a basically anti-establishment, anti-institution idea. Uh, and so that's the gist of the argument. And there's a lot of anecdotes uh, from the early founding days uh, of the United States um, and the U.S., uh, I think, National Bank, assuming state debts and things like that. And so, um, as you can see, I only remember the, the key ideas and keywords, but because I read uh, on ebook. So for each keyword, I will be able, um, as I wake up, um, if I want to know more, uh, the kind of constellation in my mind is, is already there. So I just have to search for the keyword in the ebook and then to expand on the details. So I didn't quite read all the words. Uh, at least I didn't uh, remember them uh, verbatim, but I remember the structure, the core argument, uh, the main idea. And it's very time saving. It only took me maybe uh, half an hour or less, maybe 20 minutes uh, to skim a entire book this way. Uh, but but I think that's only possible again uh, using digital technology. If it's a paper based book with no full text search, uh, this way of kind of a fractal like um, reading would not be possible because uh, it makes sure that, yeah, 20 minutes for the entire book, uh, because I, I don't pronounce it in my mind. I'm not limited by the words per minute uh, that I can speak. Uh, I just um, get in the visual stimuli and process the comprehension while I sleep. So I have to sleep anyway, right? So uh, I might as well use some of those sleeping hours uh, as uh, word comprehension time. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, so that's, I think, my reading habit. So, um, and how do I determine which book to read? Um, I, I really don't have a method. Uh, I just uh, follow interesting people. Uh, and then these people, once they share the book they read, I read those books too. And uh, books will lead me to more people. Uh, like when I read uh, the book Radical Market, that will lead me to a bunch of people, um, including Vitaly Buterin, well, who I already met anyway. Um, but so Vitaly Buterin led me to Radical Markets, <clears throat> a book, uh, Vitaly being the creator of Ethereum. Um, and that would then lead me to Glenn Weil and Danielle Allen. Uh, and uh, Weil uh, would lead me to um, the Retro Exchange Foundation, which I'm now a board member, so I'm a slashy digital minister by day and board member of social innovation organizations by night. Uh, and 
uh, well, or by date uh, in New York, um, where our foundation is formed. And that will lead me to Posner and the uh, junior, and then Posner will lead me to well his new book, uh, which the Demagogues Playbook. Uh, so that's the, the, the this particular branch. So it's just it, like any social object. Um, a social object leads me to people. People lead me to more social objects, to more people, to more social objects. So that's also a way to for me, I guess, to learn more about my collaborators uh, in the radical exchange framework. <clears throat> Five people. I would like to know, many schools around the world switch to their in switch their in person classes to fully online courses due to pandemic. Do you think it will bring negative effect on children? Um, well, first of all, in in Taiwan, we never had a large scale experience of that. I mean, the school did delay for a couple of weeks, but that's because we need to make sure that all of the schools have the medical mask uh, thermometers. Um, the, the well, soap always the most important soap and hand uh, sanitation sanitation sprays uh, and plastic shootings for lunch places um, and so on. And that's people understand how to use mask properly. Uh, you use a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands. That's also a critical um, piece of meme uh, that's necessary to go with medical mask. Uh, so uh, we prepare all that for a couple of weeks. And then the school opened as usual, uh, and the school uh, semester ended again two weeks after originally scheduled uh, around mid July. But we never had a lockdown, um, and so um, I don't have any firsthand experience of negative effect on children for fully online courses. On the other hand, though, um, as a researcher in fully online courses, um, I think uh, we can mitigate most of the negative effects by having small study clusters, like in a social innovation lab, um, my office really, we deliberately set up outdoor places, uh, but with a like transparent glass um, ceiling uh, that protects uh, from uh, Typhoon, of which there's a recent one that didn't quite go here. Uh, and then uh, so people can still study there. Uh, with uh, very good Wi-Fi connection, 5G nowadays, uh, and with projector, uh, with everything that need for an immersive experience, and with seatings arranged so that it's exactly one meter from each other, so that people don't have to wear a medical mask. Uh, and so with sufficient amount of satellite um, studying group like this, people can enjoy both in-person connections as well as um, cloud connections, peer-to-peer -peer connections across different spaces. Uh, and when the Minerva School, for example, uh, visited uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, again, we used their, um, their own foreign software, uh, but also with uh, their ambassador, really, uh, in a presidential office to serve as a bridge uh, with me and the president, and so on. And so I think the fully online courses need to be complemented with at least some way to bring your surrounding, your vicinity, your ambience to the online space. If you have virtual reality, like the XR space headset, that's the best because it doesn't need a controller and uh, you can control using your hand. And it's very light. You can wear it for like three or four hours and that's fully immersive. That's the best. But if you don't have a portable light VR device, I guess you can also substitute it with, uh, for example, in Microsoft Teams, uh, Jaron Lania, um, so-called father of VR, um, recently introduced in that software a mode where people can sit together. So instead of small squares like we currently are in WebEx, in together mode, each of us will be a person uh, sitting next to each other on this auditorium looking into a very large mirror. Uh, and so we will have um, environmental cues like who is sitting to my left and to my right. And uh, um, eye, eye contact will actually make sense. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do in WebEx. At the moment, I have to like place all of you on this row on top of my screen and mount the cam directly above it and look into the um, line 
between this, the top of my screen and the camera uh, to maintain eye contact. And that's not a natural thing to do. Uh, but with together mode, you can much easier uh, do it. And um, even if you do not have um, access to these technologies, there's also a new software that I use uh, a lot recently called highfidelity.io. And high fidelity um, avoids the problem of eye contact completely by uh, portraying the classroom as a top-down view uh, of a kind of sim city or whatever, but a top-down view. So everybody is just uh, their, their head like a cap uh, and a facing direction. And everybody wearing he headphones can navigate in breakout um, groups uh, or go to the pool or sofa or whatever. And the uh, uh, acoustic attenuation, that is to say, um, the sound that you hear uh, is entirely dependent on which um, direction you're facing in the virtual space uh, and the distance uh, of people um, as compared to you. And you could play, I don't know, poker card games uh, in that place uh, collaboratively. So even if you do not have a high quality camera, you can still participate in virtual reality with audio only uh, to have an immersive experience. So whether it's extended reality devices, whether it's together mode with a high-end camera or whether it's high fidelity with audio only, I think the um, co-presence, the together feeling is still very important for deliberation, for facilitation. Uh, and the fully online classes can deliver some of that, but only if the teacher, uh, the space designer is intentional uh, in designing that. Otherwise, if it's WebEx only, I'm afraid that it will lose a lot of the immersion uh, that people could feel um, as compared to they're in the same place. On the other hand, I mean, uh, like the Q&A format, the slider format, that's fine because we're only sharing knowledge. We're not quite uh, deliberating our common future uh, as a class, right? So we're uh, basically in the exploratory stage uh, in design thinking terms. We're not quite on the define or deliver uh, the, the convergent phases. But for convergent phases, you probably really need some sort of uh, immersiveness, the co-presence uh, feeling that I just alluded to. Uh, four people would like to ask, will Taiwan be a leading force in cyber policy? If so, how, and if not, why? Well, Taiwan, of course, is already a leading force in cyber policy. Um, our counter spam uh, method uh, require no legislation uh, and our uh, way of a arm's length uh, organization to uh, prevent abuse of, for example, children uh, in online spaces without requiring a draconian takedown rule, uh, a basically um, multi-stakeholder forum called IWIN that again is also exported to many um, countries. And our disinformation, counter disinformation uh, ways, which is again multi-stakeholder requiring no special law, but a norm that people would say, oh, in elections, we always publish the rule data of the campaign donation and expense. And when large social media platforms, I'll just say Facebook, um, we see that a lot of those advertisements go through Facebook without declaring its origin or its purpose. We sat down and had a talk with Facebook saying, look, this is our norm in Taiwan to publish the uh, details, raw data of each individual expenditure and donation. And they donation always need to come from domestic sources. Only citizens get to do campaign donation. And there's no way for us to inspect um, whether Facebook advertisements follow the same rule. So if you do not conform to our radical transparency standards, I'm afraid that you will face social sanction. And social sanction in Taiwan is a very powerful force, far more than legal enforcement, actually. So for the presidential election, Facebook just said, okay, for all the uh, political advertisement, we're going to publish exactly as your norm requires the um, up to minutes, every minute detail. And so the dark patterns of, um, you know, foreign interference uh, on election by hyperposition targeting or um, counterfactual uh, political advertisements and so on, they were actually not a problem in our presidential election on Facebook. Uh, or on Twitter and Google, which uh, simply refused to run political advertisement conforming to social norm. 
And this norm first negotiation is our main contribution in cyber policy. Uh, and the list go on, but I can uh, uh, see that um, there's many more questions now. So I will uh, um, turn to the next question. But if you have a more detailed uh, question, feel free to follow on my uh, slide. Um, five people ask, given authorized surveillance and subsequent acceptance of a surveillance state, what can civil activism achieve in keeping the U.S. government accountable? Well, uh, there's this old idea called surveillance. that is to say counter surveillance. Um, we, when you suspect that you're being surveilled by, say, the police, um, you can also wear a live streaming con uh, to reveal to the general public uh, what the state surveillance works like. And so to keep a tab on the surveillance with surveillance, that is always uh, a recourse uh, for civic activists. Uh, on top of that, <clears throat> I think keeping uh, the government accountable can also go through what we call algorithmic accountability. That is to say, to make sure that there is a norm to demand, as I mentioned, campaign donation expense, political advertisements down to the criteria of the precision targets and so on, and then build a community around these data. In Taiwan, before our presidential election, Thousands of people volunteered as fact checkers to make sure that all the presidential platforms, deliberations, debates, and so on, each and every candidate is rated and ranked by the <coughs> down truth statements um, that they, they um, espouse. Uh, and so, <coughs> and the point is not just this tallying, but rather the fact that thousands of people and their friends and families uh, get into the habit of fact checking politicians uh, using the open data that the professional media and journalists across all the different political spectrum is a cross media effort um, to make sure that people understand the claims and the facts behind the claims. And so building a fun community, optimizing for fun, sharing those social objects that could be fact checking, could be campaign donation, could be all sorts of different parts of the political process that is as important as the data and surveillance that is to say citizens as producers of political data. Um, five people ask, why does the mainland, does the Chinese Communist Party, still have the Great Firewall if the people can easily bypass it by VPN? Well, the answer, you answer it yourself. The CCP has the Great Firewall because now it's actually very hard to, to bypass it by the VPN, especially around October. Um, and so um, the, really their control over uh, the VPN scene um, has risen dramatically in the past few years. It used to be that there was no law that punished VPN users, uh, only VPN operators. But now there is a law against VPN users. It used to be that there was no law against uh, cryptography. Uh, but now there is a law that regulates cryptography um, and so on. The list goes on. Uh, and so, and even technically speaking, it's now much harder to, to run a, a VPN uh, within the PRC territory. Uh, and someone uh, with the name uh, Sherry Ye said, uh, being there for three weeks last July, and none of my VPN works. And that really is um, the case nowadays. And so unless you are very technically advanced, or you can uh, endure very slow uh, connections and unreliable connections, actually the VPN scene has changed dramatically in the past few years. Um, and so that's why the CCP maintains the Great Firewall. And they uh, also turn it to a great canon nowadays, um, starting with GitHub, and mo most recently with Lian Deng with the LIHKG, that, that's the Hong Kong uh, bulletin board system. Uh, they would occasionally turn the power of Great Firewall to serve as a distributed denial of service machine. Um, basically making sure everybody connect uh, to uh, foreign websites inadvertently become a bot in the bot network to take down GitHub or to take down um, LIHKG 
uh, well, in both cases, not very successfully, actually. But uh, the fact that they're willing to do this and that they uh, seem to uh, rely on extra legal um, um, clauses to to scare people off VPN says a lot about their recent thinking about internet technologies. Four people uh, and Brian uh, would like to know. Effective digital innovation relies on trust among the people and with the government. How can U.S. learn from Taiwan to build this trust, especially when COVID has made it worse? Well, I, I bet the organizer is finally thinking, hey, Audrey finally has a chance to go through the COVID slides uh, because the previous question has nothing to do with COVID. And so I might as well go through the COVID slides. Um, it's a very short slide. So I will now share uh, another application. So, um, Let me just um, go through the slides a little bit. Um, so just to make sure you can see the entire slide, right? Like the Lego block, digital social innovation, Taiwan can help. Okay, that's good. Right, so um, I think trust among people is more important than trusting the government. Uh, I was just interviewed by BBC last night uh, and I quipped uh, one of my tweets um, saying, in democratic Taiwan, ministers trust you. And, and that means that uh, whether you trust a minister is besides the point. The fact that ministers trust the citizenry is more important. Uh, and in Taiwan, the way to garner trust uh, among the citizenry and also uh, for the minister to trust citizens can be distilled essentially to three pillars. And that's fast, fair, and fun. So the fast part is collective intelligence. Starting last year, this is our equivalent of LIHKG or Reddit, it's called PTT. Um, and on PTT, people were upvoting this post by normal pipe. And that is a repost of Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing. Last December, the PRC whistleblower, uh, Dr. Li, posted their seven new SARS cases. He would get inquiries around the same time as posted on PTT and eventually punishments from his local police institution. At the same time, no more pipes post is being upvoted and including uh, being noticed by our medical officer. And the medical officer escalated this to the central um, um, disease control. And then they said, okay, starting today, that is to say last December, all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspections. And this says to me two things. First, the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in such a public forum. And the government trusts back to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. So the first part, always most important, is the completely openness and freedom of speech so that people can feel that the freedom assembly of speech and so on is uh, on par, if not more, than other liberal democracies. There was an emphasis on keeping open mind to new and novel ideas from the society. So not left-wing with right-wing arguments, but rather up-wing innovations that transcends uh, the existing dilemma. That's the thing that will get the most upvotes on PTT and on Taiwanese social media. And so for those uh, pe people who have heard the pink mask story, I'm sorry, I have to tell it again because it's such a good story and it perfectly illustrates um, the, this upwing thingy. Um, so in uh, April, April, I think uh, 12, um, people uh, in the CCC uh, heard that there's the toll free line 1922 and people has been calling it. And one of the people who called the line says that they have this young boy who were refusing to go to school because he was afraid he would get bullied by having only pink medical mask. Because when you ration, you don't get to pick the color. And instead of saying, uh, you know, uh, that pink is good, 
uh, or saying that pink is bad, let's um, give the boy another color, which would be traditional zero-sum thinking. Um, they said nothing of that sort. Uh, on the, our daily live stream Central Epidemic Command Center press conference, it's simply that the medical officers, including Minister Chen Shizhong, the commander, all started wearing pink medical masks. And that's it. And they kept keep doing so for quite a few days. And uh, their internet, um, social media, avatars, or whatever, including the ministry itself, changed pink. Uh, and that's gender mainstreaming. Uh, and also, uh, I think Minister Chen said uh, his favorite role model uh, when he was a boy was Pink Panther. Uh, or something. Uh, and so uh, the effect, of course, is that a boy become the most hip boy in his class because only he has the pink panther color that the heroes wear and everybody else have very dull colors. Um, and so that is the point of trusting the citizens to come up with the open innovation. <clears throat> and that includes with the journalists. Whenever the journalists have any questions, uh, basically the CECC treats journalists as uh, collaborators so that people can um, think across all different uh, ways of possible ways to communicate um, the hand washing uh, using soap or hand sanitation, physical distancing rules and things like that, and inventing with the journalists. And that's also the fun part. The CECC has this participation officer. In every ministry, we have participation officers as part of our open government work, so that instead of just the media officer talking to professional journalists or um, the uh, MPs, uh, that is the parliamentary officers, um, the participation officers talk to hashtags. Unlike MPs uh, and journalists who you can build a long-term relationship, hashtags are ephemeral things, and there's no single speaker for a hashtag. There's easily thousands of speakers for a hashtag. So how do you talk to a hashtag? Well, with internet means. So the health and welfare participation officer, you see, lives with this dog, and the name is Dong Chai, uh, a Shiba Inu. Uh, and so when the CECC says something, like remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing, the participation officer just go home and take new pictures of the dog and post it as internet meme. They don't even have to pay shelter stock. Uh, and then, um, like when we roll out physical distance, uh, the meme was that if you're indoor, you have to keep three zong chai away. When you're outdoor, two zong chai away. And remember to pre order your mask. Why? Because then the mask protects you from touching your face and wash your hands with soap. All of this went literally viral, uh, and it counters the infodemic very effectively because um, it has a higher R value than conspiracy theories. And that is the point that I want to make, the fun part uh, that makes the science and the clarifications resonate with people, genuinely with humor, uh, with no uh, personal attacks or, um, you know, uh, so-called expeditions uh, in social media. In fact, if you laughed about the Shiba Inu, or laugh about our premiere, um, then uh, really you, you can't feel outraged. And then people will be much more in tune uh, and become uh, amateur epidemiologists. There are still debates, but there are scientific debates. And this is uh, very important. So uh, fast and fun. The fair part concerning mask rationing, you probably all have heard the story already. So I will not tell the whole story. Suffice it to say that people no longer need to trust the minister, rather, the minister trusts the people enough so that if you go to a pharmacy and you have your national health insurance card and you purchase nine medical masks if you're an adult or 10 if you're a child, you expect the people queuing after you will refresh the map in just a couple minutes, it will update with the new number. If you are an adult, the number will become 49. If you are a child, the number will become 189, uh, sorry, 86. 
and if it, if it becomes 189, um, actually people will call 1922 right there saying that there's something wrong uh, with the system. And so this is participatory accountability, not unlike a distributed ledger in a blockchain. Uh, and so with more than 100 tools, even people with blindness, people with all sorts of different neurodiversity can very easily see that we're indeed ramping up the mask and make suggestions of the oversupply and undersupply. And this is at once uh, civic technology, but through reverse procurement, basically they relinquishing the copyright and then we taking it into a government domain. Uh, it became also government technology. And so that's the fair principle as collectively insured uh, by everybody using that application. Okay, so that's... Um, the slides that the organizers want me to talk. Uh, I fulfilled my duty. Uh, and so let's go back uh, to, to slide. Now, um, so the question here, uh, so uh, is the lessons, uh, and I actually worked uh, in a state-by-state -state basis, not only the co-hack hackathon with the federal government, with the AIT, but also I think I shared this chatbot design uh, with uh, New Jersey, uh, and also uh, this whole uh, slide uh, with New York. Um, and so that's me personally. I'm sure that the CCC colleagues have uh, worked with many other states as well. Um, three people said, um, what do you think the work trend of the future uh, would look like? Uh, great question. I think there's, uh, broadly speaking, uh, two uh, ideas that I want to share. First, uh, we would decouple the idea of work uh, with the idea of um, tasks. Uh, that is to say, work is something that deliver um, satisfaction value uh, to the society and also to you. And task is just uh, something that needs to be done while you perform the work. And pretty much all the tasks can be automated. So a lot of the work is to look into the working experience and design the experience so that automation can take more of the tasks so that people can concentrate on co-creation of values, on the society, on understanding each other, and so on, more closer to other humans. So that's one of the very clear trends. Um, in fact, the World Economic Forum said uh, that one of the trending new uh, work uh, is exactly this kind of experience design. So that once you finish digital transformation of your own work, you can also moonlight as a digital transformer uh, for people who are not in the same work but share the same task structure. We see a lot of that too. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that we see that uh, the generational uh, boundary uh, is blurred because across the internet, um, it doesn't quite matter uh, whether your physical mobility compared to other workers or uh, whether you uh, feel at ease more uh, in a wheelchair or standing up. It, it, it matters less because um, you can design the workplace so that it's whatever the most comfortable way you feel. Um, the only thing that's very hard to transcend is time zone. Uh, and so, for example, I have to work very, uh, very early if I want to work with my North uh, and South American friends and also work kind of late with the African and European friends. Uh, that's, there's no escaping time zones uh, because we all need to sleep. But other than that, I think there's very few hard boundaries once augmented and extended reality becomes the norm. Um, and so people, I think, will be liberated from this linear thought that uh, of a retiring age uh, or whatever. If people want to retire once in a while, um, it's decoupled from their age. Uh, and if people want to pivot, that is to say, try something else, again, that's decoupled from their age. And so a lifelong learning that's uh, in tandem with the work, I think is uh, one of the very clear trend also, because when you work uh, in a virtual augmented space, you kind of automatically leave a digital double. And once you leave a digital double, uh, coupled with assistive intelligence, that can serve as mentors uh, to other new people as well. So it's by default a learning, a co-learning experience. Three people would like to know, did you think social media companies have too much of our personal data? Is it still possible to live off the grid? Certainly it is. Um, so um, 
For example, personally, um, I use uh, as a personal phone. Uh, let me bring my phone to you. Right, and this is not prearranged. This is not a product placement, blah, blah. This is a, this is a Nokia flip phone. Uh, it's a feature phone. It tells the time. It has a beautiful, large screen. You can play snakes on it, I'm sure. Uh, and it has large physical buttons. What it doesn't have, though, is a touch screen. The screen doesn't move. Okay. So, so this, um, and it's a uh, 4G connection. This is not a ancient relic. This is literally a new phone produced, I think, only this year. So the, the point I'm, I'm making with this Nokia phone is that uh, there's zero chance for me to get addicted to social media on this phone. Um, the social media thrives on touch screen. Um, Joanne said, oh my God, I had the same phone uh, back uh, in the... In, in what? In elementary school. Uh, okay, uh, well, good to know. Um, and I bet you also play snakes on it. But anyway, um, the, the Nokia phone and uh, the, the ringtone also have not changed. Um, so the, the point I, I'm getting though, uh, is that um, the phone running Kai OS, which is a the same code base as Firefox, is all open source, um, have zero chance of getting people addicted because uh, the touch screen, which uh, wasn't there, was the main cause for us to feel that the phone is an extension of our body, that it uh, synchronizes perfectly. Uh, and once you have a high enough bandwidth between a device and you, the rest of your body, your brain, your mind start interpreting it as an organ uh, and a coprocessor. Um, Maybe you have heard a ringtone before, uh, and but with no touch screen, and indeed with only um, this large, easy to type, but very hard to input long rants um, term uh, in the keyboard, uh, there is um, a intermediation between me and this device. It's literally impossible for me to feel that this is a extension of my body. And I only work with my iPad through uh, the Apple Pencil too and not through the touch screen, again, to create a psychological distance. Uh, and so um, if you used only this phone, social media companies or really any app would not have too much of your personal data. It doesn't even have a front facing camera. You cannot take a selfie literally uh, using this phone. Uh, and the input um, uh, bit rate, uh, that's the speed, the bandwidth of input using this keyboard is maybe five bits per second, uh, 10 if you're a really fast typer. But uh, that's nothing compared to uh, a touch screen again. Uh, and so uh, it's not entirely living off the grid. This is a 4G phone. Uh, I can do most of my work, check my emails and so on. Um, I can even tweet if I want uh, using this phone. But um, it cannot get a dopamine cycle going on. Uh, there's no swipe anticipating something new. I have to actually uh, use the arrow keys and press refresh. Uh, that is to say anything that I do is intentional. There's no unconscious habitual swiping uh, that hacks into the dopamine uh, circuit in the brain. Um, and so on. I, I can go on. Uh, and I'm not really selling this device. I'm just saying that just like you can install advertisement blockers or spam blockers. Um, and so on. It's actually very easy if you use this kind of feature phone device uh, to live partly off the grid and not get addicted and not share too much of your personal data. Uh, and even if you use uh, like a desktop, uh, you can install plugins, extensions, such as uh, the Facebook feed eradicator, which will remove the unpredictable feed, leaving you with only the predictable thing. I recently uh, switched uh, the Facebook feed eradicator that I use um, to something called uh, the Facebook uh, feed eradicator uh, feminism. So um, if you 
look at my Facebook wall, there's no wall. But you see, I'm not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. Autre Lord. Or if I refresh. Great minds may have cold hearts, form, but not color. It is an incompleteness, and so they are afraid of any woman who both thinks and feels deeply. That's Sina Naslund. Uh, and finally, Malala uh, Yousafzai. We cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. Okay, so very nice uh, um, quotations uh, from, from uh, great women thinkers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what's lacking is this unpredictable feed that feeds to me. Right? So I will use Facebook even on my desktop again, only purposefully. And so that's again, a very easy kind of mental shield, if you will, uh, to the social media companies. Uh, I can go on. So three people would like to know, how do you think the upcoming 5G network will impact the environment? Great question. And the answer is, I don't know. We have to find out. Um, on, on the one hand, it can empower the Internet of Trees, the Internet of Rivers. Um, we can all very easily see in each of every uh, purchase that we make, each of our uh, conscious action, how many carbon footprint we're causing. Uh, and we don't have to guess anymore. Um, the mountains and the rivers can talk back uh, to us uh, based on the uh, work that we do. Uh, we can empower them to calculate exactly the environmental impact of each and every human action. That's a great thing. Um, on the other hand, of course, it will also make it possible for people to um, go to the mountains and rivers and uh, even the ocean and build new uh, working environments there. Uh, and so what used to be wilderness uh, will be no longer because armed only with 5G, uh, a bunch of robots can um, just make a human habitat uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, and then uh, just make sure that people who want to go there um, can run it from remote uh, using virtual reality control. That's exactly the way, by the way, that people are going to colonize Mars. Uh, and so it also empowers colonizers. That's the other hand. And uh, on the upwing, I guess, on the gripping hand, uh, 5G networks is just the beginning. On the 6G or uh, post 5G networks, the satellites uh, will uh, make sure that even the places that is uh, as high as the Himalaya, or especially the places as high as Himalaya or Sabia, the Jade Mountain, uh, can easily get broadband access by having a densely woven uh, satellite uh, and other above um, airplane um, transportation devices uh, for the repeaters and uh, communication devices. So that's uh, the direction, uh, is a upward direction. Uh, so very soon, I guess, in the next 10 years or so, we will see uh, a very different view, a holistic view. Uh, currently in Google Map, you can see the street view is only the uh, streets. Uh, but very soon, I think you will see the mountains uh, and the rivers and even the ocean and even the top of the highest mountains and so on, gradually powered by um, autonomous vehicles uh, and the post 5G networks. So we will see our spaceship, as to say the Earth, uh, I guess more clearly as a spaceship. And that may uh, have a different environmental impact now that we can feel the Earth much more readily um, as a single being rather than through uh, abstractions and clouded uh, literally by the cloud uh, so that you can't really easily see uh, the Earth in relation to the cosmos. Um, five people would like to know Brian's question. What is Taiwan's and my personal attack on cryptocurrency? Is there a future in blockchain for social innovation? Uh, for example, distributed ledgers to verify election votes. Well, we already use distributed ledgers. Um, Medical Musk um, stock uh, numbers, um, that is to say the pharmacy stockpiling uh, of Medical Musk and the participatory ledger uh, spread across more than 140 map and chatbots. That actually is a distributed ledger. Uh, in technical terms. It's just not a blockchain. It's using Git 
which I guess is a sort of blockchain, uh, but it's not, of course, uh, like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. It doesn't quite contain this uh, inherent consensus mechanism, but it is a distributed ledger. So DLTs uh, like Git um, is good in the sense that people can keep each other honest with a very low cost. Uh, and we already use that also, uh, I think, begin with EOTA, which is a cyclic graph, not a blockchain, but also a distributed ledger. Um, when you uh, measure the air quality in Taiwan, there's a easy way to do so, uh, less than 100 US dollars called the air box. And people in primary school teach uh, the data competency, how to be a data steward, a curator, um, in this kind of data democracy, using those air boxes, which contribute to distributed ledger of the real time air quality level in Taiwan. And they amass such a, a large, like tens of thousands of stations uh, in their community, so they can bargain, uh, negotiate with the environment minister, saying that we would con consent of you aggregating our data, doing analysis, even uh, calibrating it for humidity. Uh, but we ask you to work with the industrial areas to put our design into the air, air boxes, that is to say, into the industrial parks because we suspect them of polluting. But we can't break and enter it, of course. But it turns out that the government owns the street lamps. And so we put uh, air boxes on the street lamps, again, tens of thousands of which. Um, are now being collaborated in the CI, that's Civil IoT platform. And that also relies on distributed ledgers. And so Taiwan already used DLTs for social innovation across the board. People also use it for agricultural, um, like organic farming um, accountability, for uh, cross-jurisdictional uh, um, contract. Uh, so holding, for example, if you're donating to um, disaster relief like flood uh, in Nepal and so on, you can use the Ethereum DLT to make sure that, but you still donate in fiat, uh, it's not in Ethereum as a currency, but rather to make sure that each um, intermediary actually uh, delivered uh, the, the fund to the people that need the fund and so on. Um, and so uh, DLT, very useful, core social innovation already. Currency, less so because that's the same as mobile payment versus ATM and cash, um, because there's very little uh, problem with dispensing cash or faking cash. Um, cryptocurrency really only shines if you don't trust the central bank. Uh, and well, we trust the central bank very much here in Taiwan. So Taiwan sees a lot of people working like in the Ethereum Foundation to develop cryptocurrency tools for other jurisdictions to use. But at the moment, there's no so-called killer app in Taiwan uh, as compared to fiat, uh, to the new Taiwan dollar uh, from the scene of cryptocurrency. But then again, it challenges our innovators to think past uh, my limitations and they can always apply for a fintech sandbox when they come up with something that breaks existing regulations. Four people asked me, do I have aspiration to run for president for Taiwan? Well, um, first of all, uh, it's illegal, unconstitutional for me to run now, um, because in the constitution as stipulated that the president uh, for the Republic of Citizens, uh, the transcultural Republic of Citizens uh, need to be above uh, 40 years old. And I'm just in my thirties. Um, and constitutional uh, limitations notwithstanding, um, because my ways of work uh, excludes me from political parties. As I mentioned um, in the quoting uh, Posner Jr., um, political parties, uh, by its very nature, participates in a sort of zero-sum games uh, with other parties, party members. And so, because my work um, is on rough consensus and broad participation, not only human beings, but as you have heard, internet of trees and rivers, um, if I join a political party, unless I join also every other political party, um, then uh, is at odds uh, with the politic that I'm practicing. So the only political party in Taiwan that I uh, celebrated, I did not endorse or join the party. And when I uh, celebrated sending them this banquet of catnip, uh, they were not yet uh, a real political party, but they are now. Uh, the political party is called a, uh, literally can't stop this party or 欢乐无法挡. Uh, paraphrasing uh, the very happy party. 
uh, and the party uh, has this logo, uh, the same logo as the YouTube logo with a triangle tilted a little bit, pointing downward. Um, or left world or right world, whatever. Uh, so the point here I'm making is that <clears throat> unless this is this like professional comedian party um, that want to make a, I don't know, satire, a parody of political parties um, that I can more readily participate, uh, I cannot join traditional political parties. On the other hand, I'm not sure that one can run for president in Taiwan without belonging uh, and the support institutional from a political party. So I don't see myself running for president uh, with the current representative democracy. Uh, I see myself as a lower case minister. That is to say someone who advocates, who, who preach uh, digital social innovation and making sure that all the political parties are on board so that every party uh, in the presidential uh, party, that's the DPP, uh, but also the KMT, the vice president candidate, Simon Zhang, Zhang Sanzheng, uh, they both um, agreed that open government, digital, social innovation, a dedicated agency for digital transformation are very important. Uh, and um, uh, Min Zhongdang and the uh, New Power Party, uh, all of them, the Taiwan People's Party and New Power Party, they all signed on and in fact are leading uh, as co-leaders, as the open government partnership from the open parliament effort, uh, along with DPP and KMT people. And so again, I mean, uh, the open government work that I do are uh, broadly agreed by all the different party members uh, from all the parties in the parliament. And that is the kind of work uh, that I do. And um, that's um, my politics. Four people would like to know, uh, do you think you were treated differently after changing my agenda? Well, I didn't change my gender, right? I went through two puberties I, and post gender. That is to say, um, I identify with the idea that um, there's really no fixed gender for any particular person. Uh, I was born um, with a natural testosterone level that is somewhere between natural male and natural female. Um, I was born also as a left-handed writer, but I also learned to write with my right hand and so on. So um, it, it's post-gender and it's intersectionality uh, and it's empathy in my mind. Uh, so with the quote that you just uh, saw, uh, with half, a, uh, half the population left behind uh, from Malala, that's a beautiful quote. And in my mind, I don't leave anyone behind. I don't have in my mind this thought that half of the population is somehow different from me. Um, we're all homo sapiens, um, descendants of Lucy. <laughs> uh, and so that's that's my uh, point of view. Uh, and so I don't think I'm treated any differently um, and as an open transgender, uh, non-binary, but I also think that it helps me in my daily political work because people see that I can empathize more uh, and I very deliberately uh, take all the sides. And when I say publicly that I take all the sides, I guess people treat me uh, more with more trust uh, and with more empathy as well, because they can see through me the other sides as well. Three people ask, coding uh, will be mandatory in Japan's primary schools from 2020. How young do you think the Taiwanese government should provide students with coding courses? Well, we provide free coding courses to people of all ages. But in primary school level, as a K-12 curriculum designer, uh, we emphasize on design thinking and computational thinking, not coding as in uh, writing programs, but rather programming in the sense of designing programs. And that, uh, I think, is peculiar in Taiwan because we translate programming not as software engineering, uh, but rather program design, so all programmers are designers uh, in Taiwan. And uh, that has the benefit, by the way, of ensuring a good gender balance uh, because engineers are traditionally associated with boys, uh, but designers, designers are gender neutral, um, post-gender really. Um, and so I think this is really good in terms of inclusion, but also making sure that before you program, you need to listen to the stakeholders to people of all different sides to discover what they are encountering in their lives and define the common questions that they need to solve, uh, need to ask uh, using programming. 
and then you develop and then you deliver. And so that is the double diamond method from IDEO that's design thinking. And that's part of our core competence, one of the nine core competencies on um, uh, interaction uh, with uh, media, with information, with communication and so on, but with an eye on designing with other people. So when they learn, for example, Scratch, it's always by remixing each other's Lego blocks, uh, so to speak. Uh, and that is, again, why we put it in the interaction arm in our three core competencies. That's autonomy, interaction, and the common good. And so it can start as young as kindergarten, if you look at it from a design and computational thinking perspective. And only when the child is ready to learn any particular programming language, like a foreign language, uh, they need to already have a community community to speak such languages. That's my take on computational and design thinking in the K-12 curriculum. Three people would like to know, uh, given that environmental protection has become an important, yeah, one of the most important agenda, what did the Taiwanese lead toward printing physical triple stimulus coupon? Look, we tried everything we can to avoid printing physical triple stimulus vouchers. Um, for two months, uh, the entire design was uh, digital. We work with EasyCard, with credit card companies, uh, with mobile payment companies. We designed this idea that if you uh, spend three thousand NT dollars, you can withdraw two thousand of it from a nearby friendly ATM. So um, all of this is cash free and it's paperless. Uh, and it's very friendly to the environment. And I think it's also um, speaking as uh, a decentralized system designer, very decentralized because each individual bank handles their own account. And when they settle, they don't transmit any personally identifiable information. And so none of the bank or payment system, if they uh, crash because of the large uh, influx of people, uh, the every other part of the system would not crash. It's, it's a beautiful design. But the only thing, though, <laughs> is that we're a democratic country. Uh, and the people let us know very firmly that they want to um, use this triple stimulus vouchers to the people who are the smallest operators, the smallest business owners. That is to say the night market food uh, wheel cart dealers, whatever. And the common hood between these people is that they do not have a post machine. The street performance, uh, busily performing, they do not have time to operate a mobile post machine. Now you say, of course, uh, you can do a QR code scanner. That's true. Uh, on the other hand, many of those small business uh, operators, uh, food dealers and so on, tells us that they do not want to file a tax filing um, cheat. That is to say, they were tax free because they are small scale operators. They do not have to pay a business tax because they do not have a fixed operating uh, place. Or even if they do, um, the transaction amount is so small that they were uh, exempt from the Tongyi Fa Piao, from the invoice um, device. Now, if they install a post device, um, they will not be able to escape from filing their taxes. And they do not want to file their taxes uh, because they were exempt from it, you see. And many people say that these people are the one that were hurt the most during the pandemic because they just go to the places where there are a lot of people gather. And even though we had no lockdown, we did put the physical distance and we did put the limit on how many people can gather together in the same place. And so they were hurt the most. On the other hand, the convenience stores, the uh, like the PX Mart uh, or the supermarkets, they actually gain a lot, even grow uh, during the pandemic because people trust these places uh, um, to have, I, I don't know, uh, management of people's uh, inflow. Uh, and these places uh, enjoyed a surge in customers. And so the places that has the capacity to handle post payment, that's to say the credit card, easy card and mobile payments did not suffer that much from the pandemic. And the people that did suffer much do not want the post payments. Uh, and so <clears throat> after 
they let us know in not uncertain terms. Uh, we said, okay, so people who choose to spend their vouchers on night markets uh, and on uh, gathering places, uh, they can do so. Uh, and the food dealers that receive those triple stimulus vouchers don't even have to go to a bank. Many of them say they don't have a bank account. They don't have a business account. They can just use those vouchers uh, to buy the ingredients uh, from upstream vendors uh, or even enjoy their own uh, discounts when they purchase uh, their daily livelihood um, items and so on. Uh, and so that's the design uh, and people have the freedom to choose. And evidently people want to go to the physical gathering places, meet the business owners saying that, um, that they know they have suffered during the pandemic uh, and now we're going outdoors to uh, help your business. Uh, and they feel that a physical token is the way to do so. It has much more social solidarity meaning uh, compared to the mobile payments. Um, I had this idea that we should, instead of um, just a beautiful envelope for the paper vouchers, we need to also print this laser sticker, a small sticker that you can pin to the back of your phone or the back of your credit card or uh, the back of your easy card, showing that you're showing uh, solidarity to the business owners, a triple stimulus voucher sticker that would be far more environment friendly. On the other hand, uh, that um, idea didn't quite work because at that time we already allocated all our funds and, and some more uh, to the printing uh, and to the envelopes. Uh, so whatever ideas that I had, I brought it then to the e Fang coupon, uh, that is the Ministry of Culture coupon. Uh, and the Ministry of Culture then uh, solved the same problem, including the street artists and so on, using an app that would then do a QR code scanning and also a dynamic QR code that could be scanned. And the people who don't have a mobile phone or who have a mobile phone but, but that doesn't run the app like this Nokia phone, um, we can choose the paper voucher, but only in the second batch, months after the first batch of the digital vouchers. And that to me is a, a good compromise. Uh, between the digital transformation on one side, environmental protection also, and the fiscal spending. But for the triple stimulus voucher, uh, because it's already seen as the kind of the major thing uh, for the night market owners and so on to operate, we cannot wait until the second batch. So that's political reality and that's democracy for you. So um, three people would like to know, is it possible for Taiwan to have absentee voting? as in the States in the near future. Yes, but only in a referendum. And the reason is that we have a different counting process as compared to other jurisdictions. <clears throat> Our counting process is radically transparent. When you count the ballot, uh, the counters actually look uh, into the audience, seeing who is holding a camera and make sure that each ballot item uh, is filmed by the every film maker in the audience. So, so that's uh, really interesting, right? Because when people can see for themselves each and every count, there's no room for conspiracy theories. Uh, but that's also the reason why we can't that easily do absentee counting um, in this regard. If you uh, do mail-in or if you do a pre-round of voting, people will say this is the counting process is less transparent than the <clears throat> publicly um, YouTuber-based um, counting process. And if you do the YouTuber-based counting process, but you only have one person living in Kinmen uh, that uh, do absentee voting uh, for their home in Lanyu, uh, and then um, you will probably know who actually cast that vote. Uh, and so that's it. Uh, and so the point here is that only in national referenda in which everybody in all the voting booths vote for exactly the same um, choices. Can we repeat the counting process, uh, YouTuber-based counting, while ensuring that no personally identifiable information gets revealed by the counting process? Um, and so we will do that. I think the Central Election Committee say they will use referendum as a kind of testing ground, 
first uh, by e-collecting uh, that will uh, roll out soon, and then maybe uh, by absentee voting, and then maybe by e-counting and things like that. Uh, but all, always uh, when people understand that this is just for choosing things, choosing ideas, choosing issues down the referendum agenda rather than choosing people. And only when we have a solid social norm on the counting process involved, can we make it so that it works on voting in elections, that is to say, voting for people. So uh, the program coordinator let me know that our time is actually up. Um, and so uh, thanks for all the great questions. And I will read the other questions. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's um, from the program coordinator a um, private message uh, saying that I need to wrap it up. So thank you for the great questions. Thank you for the give on Andre Tom a round of applause. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, live long and prosper. Thank you. <laughs> Thank All right. you. Thank you.